Recording in progress. Hey, good morning, good morning. Um, welcome, welcome to class number two. Uh, yeah, great, I, everybody's smiling, I love that. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Okay, so that means you're looking forward to this class. Um, okay, so, uh, well, we'll wait for more people to join. And, uh, and in fact, you know, I um, kind of gathered that, uh, you know, it may, it may give the wrong impression that um, when I say you guys talk amongst yourself, I'm going to be around here. Um, it's not like I'm slacking off or lazy. Uh, and <laughs> you shouldn't take that as an example. Say, hey, even the prop is lacking off, so I don't have to do any work. Okay, no. So, uh, so what I I think I'm going to do today, uh, and you can you know you can tell me if if you guys. Um, you know, um, prefer otherwise. I'll, I'll, so any topic in data representation, especially the challenging topics, any, any, any of the topics, just keep pulling up these topics that you want me to talk about, okay? Uh, and, and until you guys are bored, um, I will talk about them uh, and, and try and explain these in as many different ways as possible, right? And, and by the way, again, I wanna say data representation, um, it's a comp it, it looks very different from what we're going to do from next week onwards. Okay, next week onwards we'll be doing programming, um, you know, uh, hardcore programming like <laughs> you know C plus plus programmers out there doing. Well, you know, we'll start with simple programs, uh, and then before you know it, before you know it, uh, you'll actually be writing some really uh, involved programs that uh, you uh, you'll be surprised. Okay, you, in fact, you should uh, link up on, uh, on with with some of my past students who are doing CS two B now. They're on the Reddit. Okay, you can ask them, you can ask them saying, hey, you know what, uh, how do you compare uh, your C++ knowledge to when you started programming, and you can actually see the videos uh, of past classes in which those students were actually coding like you in class. And then, by the way, every one of you will get a chance to code in class, um, like, you know, live. If you look at the videos, you'll see, right, you share the screen, and then, you know, one of us, me or, and some of your classmates will be uh, calling out the code that you type. And, uh, and the way it works is actually, I think it's very, uh, it's very surprising, I, to me, anyway, when I first found out, uh, because um, I always thought that, you know, CS2A students, um, in, the, in the past, I thought, CS2A students, um, it's, um, it, is it a good idea to put them on the spot? Okay, and tell them, all right, you're going to be coding in front of everybody right now. All right. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, you know, that's a sure way to reduce my class count because, you know, students are going to start dropping off like the, you know, flies. Uh, but actually, it turned out to be the exact opposite. Okay, because, uh, and as you'll see yourself and as you'll experience yourself, uh, right? Because as it, uh, I think we started this, you know, three or four, three or four quarters ago. Right when I started to get students on screen and they type and they call out the code, um, and then uh, there were some students who uh, had absolutely no experience at all coding and even no experience in computer science and all. Right, uh, so they started coding uh, and and uh, initially they would just be in the mode of a typist, okay, which is perfectly fine because I'll be calling out the code and you'll just be typing, listening and typing, listening and typing. That's all, okay. Um, but then you just watch watch how they're coding even towards the end of the same class, or maybe the common, you know, second time, third time, you can see the difference, okay? Uh, and you'll see that uh, they're coding, but they're not waiting for me to uh, speak out the code anymore as time progresses, right? Uh, so they're typing ahead, and this is incredible to watch. And I don't know if the students themselves uh, uh, observe this about their own, uh, you know? So uh, it's, it's happening, and, uh, but they will absolutely see it if they go back to the videos. And, and look at what's going on, they'll say, hey, that was me, and <laughs> that was me too. And look, they look like two different people altogether, right? And so we'll, we'll get there, okay? So I think I have some ideas uh, now for what we can do later on uh, in this class, maybe after week, uh, let's say week uh, five, okay? Week five, well, we need a looping. Uh, we need to have covered looping, branching, and all these basic stuff. Uh, arrays, okay, arrays, okay. So week five. Week five, we would have covered all of the material needed to produce any program out there in the real world, okay? I'm talking about Google, Microsoft, all of these things, you'll have all the nuts and bolts required. Where, where, the, where it starts to become different uh, in 2B and 2C 
is that you know although you have all the nuts and bolts required to build anything out there by week five okay <laughs> by week five uh, what you learn after that is how you can put those nuts and bolts together to make your job easier down the line because if you're going to put the whole universe together using individual atoms it's going to take you infinite time right <laughs> Uh, so, so what we do is, well, you know what, I don't want to build this whole house with the grains of sand. Uh, let me first put these uh, grains of sand together and stick them together like bricks. So it's easier, right? And so on. So later on, that's what you're going to be learning. But by week five, you will actually have all the nuts and bolts. You know, and it's not just C++, any programming, you go to Java, Python, and so on. Many people make the mistake of thinking, well, you know, it's a long course, but it does take 10 years, it, I think. <laughs> 10 years or equivalent of 10 years of mental time to master the subject completely, right? Meaning that you're totally comfortable with it. You can just, someone could just uh, wake you up in the middle of your sleep uh, and then drop you in the middle of some huge code base, right? And say, well, from tomorrow onwards, everybody in the company has been fired. You're going to be responsible for it, okay? So, <laughs> so you'll be, you know, you'll be, you'll be okay with that. You won't panic. You'll say, well, okay, well, you know, I don't know if I can do it all tomorrow, but I'll start tomorrow, but you won't sweat it out. Right? You'll say, yeah, I'll, t I'll take a crack at it. And uh, so that kind of comfort, level of comfort, it'll take, it'll take a while uh, to come. But uh, the um, confidence that you will be able to do anything at you, thrown at you uh, programmatically, given infinite time, like a Turing machine, right? <laughs> given infinite time, I can so solve any computational problem thrown at me, it provided it has a solution, right? Um, that you'll be set up for by the uh, end of week five. So we'll, we'll start doing that. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm trying to think of different games, right? We programmed some games uh, last quarter and the weeks uh, and the quarters before. Uh, it's interesting, simple games, but they're still challenging and interesting to play also. We did that. Uh, so uh, we have time, we have five weeks, right? I'm pretty sure we'll come up with uh, some interesting games that are different from what we've done before to program. I think it'll be fun. It'll kind of lead naturally into CS2B and some, some, some more cool stuff you can do in CS2B. Right? So we'll do that. So as for today, uh, let's just say that uh, um, any topic you're con finding confusing in uh, data representation, I'll you know I'll take a stab at it uh, to try and explain it in different ways, right? Because you know uh, maybe uh, you asked about two's complement and a, a bunch of classmates explained it to you, right? In different ways because each one tries to define explain it in a different way, different perspective, right? Um, but your uh, but the way that you are trying to understand it may not sync with any of those, right? Maybe you're trying to understand it like that. Uh, so, uh, but these classmates, you know, most of them aren't old enough to have tried many different ways. So they may not have experienced that. So, but I have experienced it, right? So I have so many, yeah, so many students now in the past. So I know the different places where students get stuck. Uh, so I know that if one particular explanation doesn't work, we can try another angle that a fellow student may not have tried before, okay? So I'm happy to do all that. Uh, so we can talk today uh, and, and, and remember, okay, today's the last day we get to talk about data representation issues, right? And data representation, although it is not critical to pass CS2A, in fact, I, I bet that there are other sections of CS2A that you can do, either at Foothill, other colleges, anywhere else. They, they don't even touch upon data representation. They go directly into program. On day one, you start writing hello world and things like that, okay? Um, I don't think that is conducive to really learning the language, especially C++, right? Maybe you can get away with that in Java and Python and things like that, where data types are not so crucial, and you can let the interpreter or the compiler make choices, like, uh, you know, what this should be and all, but in C++, also heavy duty programming assembler level, thinking about things from the CPU's perspective, right? Um, it really, really helps to know about data representation. And I think it is so simple, right? It is so simple to learn that a lot of people just skip it, saying, well, it is simple and I don't need it, so I'll go. No, that is a bad idea. C++ programmers need to spend time, even though it is just a week or so, to get to the bottom of data representation issues, Try and completely understand what bits and bytes are, how they're shuffled around, uh, how they represent information, right? Um, because even though you're not going to explicitly use it, <coughs> so I'm going to manipulate bits here. Actually, there is a lab in CS2A, a quest in CS2B, a quest in CS2B where you have to fiddle around with bits and bytes, right? You have bit manipulation. Um, it's an interesting quest, okay, uh, in CS2B. Um, but other than that, there is no explicit uh, bit manipulation anywhere. You won't see that in most 90% of C++ programs out there. Um, but the data representation issues will subconsciously guide your decisions, okay? And that you will see, right, later on when you go and hire people, 
okay? And, and you have them implement programs for you. And, and you do a you know, review saying, oh, okay, right? You will see the difference between someone who knows the ins and outs of data representation and someone who doesn't. Just in the choices of the data types they use, right? Whether it's a primitive data types where I need to use an integer there, I need to use a character there. That's integer needs to be a signed integer, unsigned integer, um, those things. Or whether even to use the same kind of reasoning, follows through to a more abstract and higher level data structures, you know, like uh, vectors or uh, is this, does this vector, uh, vector need to be a vector of floating point integers or they, does it just need to be a, a vector and <laughs> not floating point integers, how can an integer be floating point, okay? So, uh, so does this vector need to be a, a vector of floating point numbers? Okay, or does it need to be a vector of double double precision floating point numbers, which are you know floating uh, 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 fractional fractional numbers that can uh, store bigger ranges, right? Or does it just need to be integers? Uh, or does it need to be short integers, like <laughs> integers that you can just store in two bytes? These are decisions you'll actually make, right? You'll make these decisions when you're doing higher level programming because um, when when you when it comes to processing lakes and lakes of data, well, I don't know lakes. I thought lake is the term out there that people are using. Um, but lakes, huge amounts of data huge amounts of data, um, you'll start making decisions about how to store the data and, and suck in the data and, and stream the data in the most efficient way because your algorithm now, the you'll come, you'll come in, you, uh, into situations where you write algorithms that are so fast, right? They're so fast that they can process algorithm, process data thrown at you at any speed, right? Well, not any speed, the speeds that are capable by even terabit uh, data networks. Well, I don't know about terabit data networks, most data networks that you get from home, right? Or, you know, or even in industrial settings, um, gigabits per second, right? Uh, your algorithm will be able to process it. However, the rate at which data is coming at you is not fast enough. Yes. Okay. You'll come across. Yeah. So like engineers, right? Uh, uh, civil engineers or hydraulic engineers or something like that. I don't know if we got uh, those people in class, but you'll know, right? Sometimes you might build an infrastructure with pumps and everything capable of pumping through millions and millions of gallons of water every day. Uh, however, the pipes leading into the substation may not support that. Right. So you'll say, well, you know, I've got a huge infrastructure here. I invested millions of dollars in building it, but the pipes leading in, they're not enough. Right. Uh, so you need to widen the pipes. So how do you, how do you make these choices? So to make everything optimal. So then you'll say, okay, now that's why, that's when you'll say, well, I really wish I knew data representation, you know, uh, master data representation before, because instead of using this pipe, I could have used that pipe on day one, right? Because changing the pipes will take a huge amount of effort and time and investment. You want to, you know, so those are the kinds of decisions that will be guided by having a solid knowledge of data representation. That is why I think, you know, C++ and assembler, I don't know, I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, talk out there in the industry saying, oh, C++ is history. There's this new language is called Rust and all these other things, you know, memory safe typing and you've got to use. Uh, and I don't think that anything is really going to displace assembler machine level code and C++, they always, always have their place because it gives you a different way of thinking about things. It's because, you know, every programming language gives you a different way of looking at the problem and different, you know, different way of thinking about things, right? And that's why everything has its place. You know, Java, for example, it says, you know, don't worry about the memory management, okay? Python, all these things. Don't, Python is a different, right? So Java, don't worry about the memory management. I'll take care of the memory management for you because you know, as as C plus plus, you got to have a lot of memory management uh, skills in your mind already. Otherwise, you're not right. But uh, uh, a lot of people get scared away by the memory management issues in C plus plus and say, oh, you know, if I want to learn C plus plus, it's really hard because you got to be there'll be leaking memory and shit like that. Okay, but that's not really the case because uh, it's just a question of developing. The discipline during the early stages of programming. Okay, the, and again, it's very very important early stages of programming. It's discipline, just like in life, right? If you have, if you've, because getting disciplined is hard. For me anyway, developing discipline was very hard for me. Uh, it took me a lot of time, effort, uh, anxiety, and, you know, uh, and, and many, many months even of, uh, you know, just going to bed saying, well, I'm never going to be a disciplined person. I'm just going to be this unruly person. You know, uh, I'm just going to be, right? And you, and you go to bed saying, well, I, that's what it is. I can't change myself. Um, but uh, if you don't keep, if you don't uh, give up, eventually you get disciplined, but then the discipline actually served you better later on when you come to something that you actually do want to learn, okay? I want to learn that, but I don't have the discipline to do it because there's all these other things creeping in, right? So how do you, so, and so the discipline 
but then after you learn the discipline, it's kind of automatic, right? You talk to other people who do these things. They do these things in a disciplined way, but they're not consciously being disciplined. It's all unconscious because now they can focus their 100% energy, uh, energy on, and, on, on the task at hand and the logic and, 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 the, and enjoy doing things without, you know, the discipline part is now in the subconscious, right? So same thing with programming also. There are a lot of programmers out there, even today, right? Out there um, that um, can program in higher level languages but they lack the discipline, the programming discipline. But by programming discipline, I don't mean the other kind of discipline saying, well, you know what? Um, I can't uh, go on a you know a date on Friday night. I gotta, uh, um, I gotta sit down and finish this and not eat my you know, uh, food until I crack this lab. Or you know, all these, you, you, uh, you know, or not play, play Fortnite. <laughs> that is the biggest thing, right? So uh, everybody's calling you to play Fortnite uh, and all your friends are lined up and you say, no, no, I gotta do my CS2B <laughs> to a, uh, quest today. I'm not gonna play Fortnite. <laughs> Right? And instantly you'll be an outcast, I think, right? Say, oh, that guy is a nerd. Okay, no, that's not true, really, because you know um, the the guys who say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm I'm going to be disciplined. They have, they will have. They're investing their time. It's like compound interest, right? You take five hours of your time today and invest it in developing a skill. That five hours over compound interest in ten years' time will be like five. 50 years of your time you know, in your life will be, will be saved by spending a little bit of time now. And, and I think the, the thing that I have seen in many students, and it may not be the same case for you, is that um, a lot of students, um, well, certainly my, in my case when I was young, uh, was um, we have time. We have a lot of time. It's just, just like saying when you have a lot of money, right? Now you have a choice. You can either take just, the, uh, just enough money from the bank to live a reasonably happy life, Okay, but you have a lot of money left over. Now put the money that's left over in, uh, in, in, in some kind of account. You know, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be living on the streets. Live a happy life, do what you want, but don't go excess, right? And, and, and put it in the bank and you'll just be surprised because you know, that money just becomes invisible now and you'll just still be having a reasonably happy life. But later on, when you really want to do something, you don't have to go, you know, knocking on some uh, venture capitalist door saying, I need a million dollars to do this, right? Because your money that you put away would already be there. You don't have to go to Y Combinator and things like that saying, give me $10,000, I want to do this, right? Because you'll have the money, same like that, okay? Because the discipline will basically set you up to when you come to a, later on, maybe uh, some of you don't have ideas already to turn into big products, right? But chances are very, very high that before you guys hit, I don't know, 30 years uh, of age, right? In the next 10 or 15 years, I'm pretty sure you, many of you will come up with kick-ass ideas, okay? And 99% of these kick-ass kick -ass ideas just go waste, okay? It just evaporate into the air for the reason that the person who had the idea did not have the skills to carry it out. And they had to go ask other people to say, hey, I have this idea, can you come and do this for me? Okay, uh, you know, that never works in my opinion. If you don't already know how to do it, you can get someone else to do it, right? If you know how to do it, you can get someone else to do it and say, well, can you do it for me because I'm gonna be doing something else. But you can also follow there, right? But all the uh, CEOs that I know who get external CTOs to do something and they actually don't know what needs to be done themselves, the CEO doesn't know, they can't give you know good ideas because what happens is the CEO builds something because they have a vision in their head which is not the same as what the CEO wants. They'll say, well, you know, change it, change it, and it goes through so many iterations, so many pivots that uh, you know the, the venture capitalist money runs out and and the company is run driven into the ground, right? So those kinds of situations are bad and bitter. You don't want to run into those, and you can set yourself up against those things happening by just investing a little bit of time now, just like compound interest, okay? I'm not saying don't play Fortnite at all. Don't play, you know, don't go on dates. Obviously, you know, you're young and you have hormones and all, so you gotta do all these things, you know, but don't go excess is, is the only thing because CS2A, everything that you have now, especially in community colleges, um, you're getting a high class education for, uh, for I don't know, uh, free, uh, practically free, 200 bucks, 200 bucks per class, right? Uh, but some of the classes you get here are like kick ass, you know, especially if you go to some of the art department classes at Foothill, uh, the facilities we have in the arts department are, you know, tremendous in, in, in ceramics, for example, they have, you know, so many different kilns, so many different chemicals and, uh, you know, all these different glazing techniques and we have experts who have their own studios and so there are, and, and um, so there are so many facilities offered for absolutely no, you know, very, very cheap. And so you should basically take advantage of that instead of saying, I got a lot of time now and I'm going to just fritter it away. 
right? So uh, mean, that is what it means. You got a million dollars now. Uh, you're saying, I'm going to spend all the million dollars now. Instead of saying, I'm, I, I only need $10,000 a month right, right now to live. Uh, so I, why do I, what am I going to do with the remaining $900,000, right? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll live $900,000. No, that's a bad idea, right? So it says you have a lot of time now, but don't waste all the time um, doing Fortnite. Um, the, I don't know, it's, it's still Fortnite. It's still the top game, uh, but uh, it was a few years ago, right? Um, but you'll say, you know, I'm going to do this a little bit, and then I'm going to go back and do this because this is where my major investment is. And, and I think you'll all really um, thank yourselves for it. You know, five or 10 years ago, later, you'll thank yourselves for it, saying, well, you know what? Thank goodness I did that there uh, rather than because how many of you remember? Uh, I'm pretty sure that you, you might have played with Nintendo. Uh, five years ago, because you know the Switch was out five years ago, right? So you would have played Switch games with uh, you know, with your friends five years ago. But do you remember the details of the Switch games that you played with uh, friends five years ago? No, you don't, right? Many of them. Some some of them you do when you have you know some other uh, uh, events happen that you know, are memorable. But many of these games go away. It's just momentary pleasure, right? So you got to get really good at identifying what is momentary pleasure, transient pleasure, what uh, with lasting pleasure. And uh, lasting pleasure comes from developing knowledge that will help you down the line. And, and so I hope that you will take this opportunity to pick up as much as you want, because there's lots and lots of people at Foothill, any college you go to. You know, some of you are at UC, in, in UCSD, UCSC, and all those other places. There's so many people around you in colleges, right, in colleges um, that know their shit, okay? They can teach you as much as you want, because they're saying, I, I, I have everything you want. Uh, I'm willing to give you as much as you can take. Right? And, and most of the time, what uh, people teach is limited only by the syllabus and uh, official guidelines saying this is, you know, the maximum you can load students with. Um, but I know uh, that, you know, if students are able to take more, there are lots of professors, including me, who say, well, let's do this. Let's do this. And, you know, we can do an offline thing, you know, uh, a, a group of students uh, working on this. And uh, I could participate in that, too, and say we'll do this, which is, you know, extra credit and things like that. So all of those will become possibilities once you get the hang of the basic things and again basic getting the hang of basic uh, the stuff is not at all big like other people make it out to be right and, you know I, 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 for some reason i'm just getting uh, recommendations from uh, google uh, about programming languages a lot of these now on my phone and i don't know why you know my browsing habits really haven't changed um, but i read many of those and i i see that uh, a lot of people are really scared about c plus plus Right. Uh, and uh, and uh, they approach it saying, well, you know, I already know Java, but I'm, you know, I, I'm really scared about going into C++ because it has all these issues. There's nothing to be scared about. Right. They're all exactly the same. The only thing you need to know with C++ is that there is this other one more piece called memory management. You just need to get the hang of it. And you have a lot of time in CS2A to get the feel of it. Okay. We'll start. In fact, we won't even start talking about it until after week seven. Right. After week seven, you'll start dipping your feet into memory management. Uh, and then you'll have a whole seven weeks or five weeks to get used to it. And, and then the holidays after that. Um, but, and it's easy. It's very easy once you get the hang of it, right? And it is important to get the hang of it because in 2B and 2C, um, I think that a lot of students spend over 50% of their time with quests, okay? In quests, uh, in the 2B and 2C quests, a lot of time is spent just debugging memory issues, okay? Saying, well, you know what? Um, this thing is not working, mysterious error is happening and I don't know how to do this and I have to track how the memory is being allocated and freed and so on and so forth. Um, and, and they spend a lot of time and you can avoid the frustration of you know, doing that um, by just mastering the memory issues because those guys you know, who know about the memory issues, they subconsciously make the right decisions when making these, linking up these complex data structures. Because they know this needs to go there, that needs to go there, right? Uh, and, and so they'll make these decisions. And so they're not stuck with these bugs, which are um, insurmountable in a way, right? Because they, many students will just, if I look at the logs in the questing system, um, I see some students who spend several days, several days um, um, just getting past one milestone, one mini quest, okay? Saying, well, they try that and it's uh, not working, not working, not working, not working, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of submissions. And each time it's a memory error, but it's in a different place. And, uh, and that is very, very hard. And that is enough, I think, to, um, to uh, put people off C++. And that's the kind of experience that uh, tells um, you know, a student C++ is hard, 
okay? You should get away from it. And, and it's even worse if that student goes away and makes a forum post, right, on Stack Overflow or somewhere saying, well, you know what, I tried to learn C++ and I, you know, I got tanked because there's so, so many crazy things happening all over the place and it's hard to manage what a uh, nasty language C++ is, right? Why should you bl blame C++ being, for being a nasty language? Because uh, in, instead of uh, not, for, for not picking up the discipline to manage that, right? So it, it has a lot of power, but if you don't know how to use the power, it's going to explode all over your face, right? And, and so you can't then complain and saying, well, I used that in the wrong way and then I exploded in my face, right? So, and, and then a lot of people will not read, uh, I used it in a long way, but they'll read, hey, that person used C++ and it blew up in their face, okay? And then it, it picks up this bad rap. Uh, so it's, uh, so that's, there's nothing scary about C++, okay? So you should uh, absolutely, I'm saying this because some of, some some students uh, introduce themselves saying, I'm going to I'm enroll in C++, but I'm nervous because even though I know these other languages, um, I'm nervous about C++, everybody's saying it's hard. So it's not, it's not hard, okay? And you'll find out yourself. And, and hopefully you'll tell the uh, next batch the next batch CS2A students, hopefully all of you will be in my CS2B next quarter, uh, right? And you will post in the CS2A forums saying, well, you know what? I thought CS, C++ was hard, but after doing this and I'm now do, doing the harder quest and I, I, I'm okay with that, right? Because you need to reassure your juniors too, just like I'm doing it for you now. So, uh, and, and, and you can take my word for it. And if I'm wrong, you can also say that too, right? You can, you can say that in the forums um, next quarter saying, well, you know what Anand said, it was uh, easy, but actually it wasn't easy for me. Um, because that, you know, maybe I missed something, right? So, uh, so I, I'm happy. To, so, but I, I don't think I'm wrong, but it is actually, in, it's all the same. Right? At the end of the day, at the end of the day, if you think about it, uh, all programming languages, right? Essentially boil down into machine instruction. Yes? Whether, whatever language you write in, whether it's Go or PHP or Java or Python or C++, everything trickles down into machine instructions. So at the end of the day, everything is really ones and zeros, but basically it's a Turing machine. So any program that is computable can be computed by a Turing machine. Just you know, if it's a, if it's a, some if it's a, it's, it's some it could take very very long uh, if if you write it out in Turing code to for, you know in, in with I don't know if you guys uh, if you are is uh, do we offer a theory of computation class here at Foothill? No, are Turing machines taught at any class in in any 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 uh, course at Foothill? It's usually taught in theory of computation, okay? I don't know if we run a theory of computation, but Eric, uh, Eric, I don't know if you know Eric, he's one of our profs. Um, he wanted to introduce a class called CS49, okay, or 49A, uh, and it's called Foundations of Computing. I don't I, I think we ran the class at least a couple of times. I don't know if it's being offered still, but maybe that is a class that has a good chance of talking about Turing machine. Turing machine is basically an abstract computer, right? It says if you can do it in a if you can if you can do it in a uh, Turing a Turing machine, oh, I want I don't want to go into the details of that. If anybody wants to talk about that, just send me an email um, and we'll set up another class, right? A free class, uh, uh, non-scheduled uh, on you know not not regular class. We will say set up a you know half an hour or one hour session when I can talk about a Turing machine and what it is and how it relates to computing and so on and so forth. It's, and it's all again, very simple. A Turing machine is basically saying, how would you do a computer if you didn't have electrons? That's all, right? If you didn't have electrons and bits and bytes and electric currents, can you still make a computer? And the, the answer is yes, you can make a computer because what is what is what does a CPU do? A CPU basically just looks at these bits and bytes and makes decisions saying, well, you know, do I need to go here or go there, go here and go there, right? You can do the same thing on a notebook too. So instead of writing out the bits and bytes in your transistors inside of the your computer, you can write the bits and bytes on a piece of paper. And then you want to change a bit, you just need an eraser and you need to erase, scrub out the one and put a zero in its place. And the one has been turned into a zero. Yes? This is going to take you longer to do that, but it's still possible. Yes? Okay, so it's possible, but then you know, change, using an eraser and changing a one to a zero is maybe going to take you like two seconds. Yes, but if you use a CPU and say, send a, an electrical pulse and say, change that bit to a zero, that'll happen in a nanosecond or, you know, a millisecond, right? So what's the difference between a millisecond and, a, and, and two seconds? They're like, you know, several orders of magnitude. That is why, you know, there's a difference between computable and, uh, you know, actually practical. So we say that this is computable, meaning it is eventually computable. It will terminate in the limit, right? After 5 billion years, you'll get the answer. Just like deep thought, right? The, 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 the fictional computer in um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you'll get the answer after 7 billion years. 
but if you run it on this machine where everything happens much faster, you'll get it in seven days or seven seconds or seven milliseconds, right? So that is the main difference. And uh, so that, that's all there is, really. That's the main difference. And uh, so I don't know how we got started started talking about that uh, but basically that's all it is okay so uh, uh, knowing whether a thing can be computed at all which is a different way of thinking about things and uh, as uh, as uh, uh, you know most of the time especially in math we're, we're uh, made familiar with looking for analytical solutions saying here is the problem you just you know, uh, and, and the solution is true. It's, it's, it falls out like that. There's another way of getting to the solution, which is saying, here's a problem. Uh, and then um, by doing a sequence of steps, you don't get the solution, but you get to a place which is closer to the solution. Okay. Now that is not, think about it. It is not a solution. It's just a sequence of steps. It's just a sequence of steps. It is not the solution and it's not going to take you to the solution. However, if you can prove that wherever it takes you is now closer to the solution than before, that's enough, right? Because you just need to keep repeating that again and again, right? Like a kid uh, learns to walk. It's not getting to that place immediately with one step, but taking that one step itself is really hard for a child, right? So it takes a lot of time. It learns a step, but once it masters that first step, it knows all it needs to do is take many steps just like that, okay? Repeat it in a loop. And then it'll get to the solution. That is called an iterative way of getting the solution, right? The analytical way gets from the problem to the solution in one step like that is mathematical proof. It's true, right? The iterative way is just going in steps. But the, the challenge in iterative ways is that, well, you know, you got a step, but how do you know it's going to the solution? Maybe it's going somewhere else because, you, because where you land is not the solution. So how do you know if, if you're going toward the solution or not? So that is where a lot of the thinking and the ingenuity of computer scientists come in to saying, well, you know, I got a solution uh, and I can prove that if you take this step repeatedly, it'll take you to the solution, right? Because with one step, you can't tell, but if you can prove it, and that is ingenuity. And you'll actually find out that, you know, many things that you will do later on in CS2B and 2C, you'll find that you'll be doing things that uh, don't seem obvious at all, don't seem like it's gonna take you to the solution, but uh, you can show that, well, after 5 million iterations, it will take me to the solution, right? And, and, and so those are the things that you can solve um, that people uh, would not have been able to solve without using computational techniques. Because there are some things that, you know, analytically you cannot solve, but iteratively you can approach. And, and so, um, so that, that, that you uh, find out, okay? So I think we'll have a great deal of fun. Uh, so today, so let's take uh, data representation, uh, anything you have. Um, and by the way, uh, people in the last row, uh, James, uh, Yu Yang, uh, Megumi, uh, uh, Wang Qian, who else? Nam, Luke, uh, Huaju, Mohammed. Okay, switch on your cameras, please. And, uh, and then we can get going. Okay, great, great, fantastic. Okay, so today what we'll do is any topic, uh, any uh, particular subtopic in module zero um, or about data representation that you have uh, a little bit of confusion about. I'll talk about it. I'll try and explain it in different ways. Um, data representation, well, you know, uh, two's complement is is usually people have uh, you know trouble with that. Floating point representation, uh, negative and un, 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 negative and non-negative. Um, again, I said negative and non-negative, not negative and positive, right? Why did I say negative and non-negative instead of negative and positive? Can someone tell me that? I feel like it had to do with like the example definition we started off with that like it it's just two numbers to get you to a zero or like the overflowing point so not necessarily like I know that's that's the way I took it. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the answer is there in what you said. The answer is there in what Adul. Uh, how do, what do you say, Adul or Adul Zer? Oh uh, yeah, Adul Zer. But um, my middle name is Erica, so that might be easier to say too. Oh, Erica, Erica. I, I don't care. Yeah, either way, it's fine. Uh, so uh, so Erica said um something and the answer is in there okay so okay, can someone tell me why because this is important this is important when you could go to do uh, sorting for example later on okay because in sorting also is a very similar distinction uh, between people always say sorted in a, a non -descend, ascending order or descending order no but the difference is that you have sorted in non ascending order or non descending order just like that well no we won't do that now we won't talk about that now but here uh, Instead of saying positive and negative, I said negative and non-negative numbers. And the reason for that, as Erica said, is that there is a zero hiding in there. And a zero is neither negative nor, nor, nor positive. 
Yes. So if, if I say zero, if I say positive and negative, zero has gone out, right? So there's no place for zero there because it's neither positive nor negative. So that's why people always say negative and non-negative numbers and non-negative numbers cover zero also. And in our data representation, um, that's what we do, right? So uh, we have negative numbers and then the non-negative non numbers uh, will, will include the zero all the way up to infinity, right? The negative numbers go from negative one to negative infinity. So, and, and, and the other thing, which is not really related to CS2A, but is a, is a, is a side uh, information that, you know, side, side piece of information that you may actually find interesting is that one over zero is not a number. Yes, one over zero is not a number. Many people think that one over zero is infinity, right? Infinity is a big number because, you know, uh, you keep reducing the number. One over one is one, one over half is point two, one over a quarter is four. So if you reduce the denominator, the number gets bigger and bigger. So when you get to zero, it should be a big ass number. So infinite. So they say one over zero is infinite. But when you can try and calculate one over zero on a calculator, or on a computer like you do, you don't get infinity. You actually, infinite, you do get infinity for some things, okay? In fact, you know, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, on a computer, you will actually get the word INF for inf true infinity, uh, negative infinity and positive, you'll get them. But if you do one over zero, you won't get infinity. You'll get a strange thing called NAN, right? Anybody know what NAN means? NAN means it is not a number. That is NAN, not a number. And the cool thing is that NAN is the only value that you cannot represent in data right now, right? We're using non-abstract means, right? If you, because we, we have a concrete representation for every single data item that we can come across because we say, this is the data item, this is how we store it using bits. Um, but when it comes to uh, infinity, well, one over zero, you cannot represent. It. And why is it? Why is it that a one over zero is not a number? Why? Why don't we say it is infinity, which is a positive, a huge number? Because zero, as you know, as some of you who have done calculus know, right? Well, you know, you said one, and and then the denominator was positive, and you approach zero from this side, and so the 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 quotient got bigger and bigger. But you could have done the same thing from this side. The denominator could have come from negative one. In that case, you know, divide by negative half, a neg negative quarter, negative and so on, then the number, the, the, the quotient, it doesn't get bigger and bigger. It gets smaller and well, less, not smaller and smaller, you know, uh, uh, lower and lower in negative magnitude, right? So it goes negative infinity. So one over zero, when someone says, what is one over zero actually? Not one over, uh, you know, X where X tends to zero from the positive side, okay? Then you know it's infinity. But if, it, you know, if it's over one over zero where X just tends to zero, you don't tell him which direction X is tending to zero from, then it's not a number because it is both positive infinity and negative infinity at the same time. So that is why, that is why it says N-A-N. It's not a number. I don't know how to represent it because there's two different values. Yeah, so isn't that cool? Okay, because you'll come across these, you know, when the arithmetic gets a bug, right? And I think it may, it is something called an exception. When you try and divide one over zero, um, the CPU, the, the program, I think it's a CPU, right? It'll throw an exception, meaning it is a, an exceptional situation. I don't know how to handle it, okay? That's really what it says. An exception is a situation where the, the CPU, which is your workhorse, it's running the program inside your CPU, inside your computer. Uh, it's coming, it com uh, comes to an instruction and it says, well, you know what? For the first time in my life, I don't know <laughs> what the answer is. The CPU says, I don't know, because it's, I don't know whether it's positive or negative. You let me out of this, you know, I, I don't want any part of this, okay? So <clears throat> it says NAN and that uh, you'll see that and it'll throw an exception and it'll kill your program <clears throat> because it kills your program because the CPU doesn't know what to do after that. So uh, right now, we're not gonna do any exception handling. In fact, entire two way, we're not gonna be handling exceptions. Exceptions are actually very simple. In fact, you only uh, need to work with exceptions for one quest. Well, you know, you need to work with exceptions, but you only learn exceptions in one quest and, and in two CS2B, right? You work quest number five, you know, this is what an exception is. This is how you raise an exception, that's all, okay? And you'll get to learn that later on, but that is what an exception is. An exception is a situation in your program which you don't know how to handle. So if you don't know how to handle it, all you have to do is just pass the buck. And that's what an exception is. An exception says, I, I, I came across a situation in this program that the CPU cannot execute, right? And I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to give it to someone who told me to run, okay? And in this case, the, the program that told your program to run is another program called the operating system. It's like, you know, Windows or Mac or Unix or Linux. This is the operating system that fires up your program and says, hey, program, I've loaded you up in memory. Go and run. 
Okay, well, let's see, you know. So um, that program will now get the exception saying, hey, you know what, you told me to run, but there was an exceptional situation, you handle it, I'm <laughs> going home, okay? So that now the operating system needs to handle that program. I'll say, you know what, uh, I, uh, this, I'm gonna kill you, <laughs> right? Because I don't know how to handle it either, right? So that's essentially what happens. And it happens to many uh, students with uh, programs where they come, um, come across divide by zero errors, right? I think it's a divide by zero exception. It's in, even called a divide by zero exception, I think. I don't know. Right, uh, exceptions are nasty things, right? So typically when you write programs, you try to avoid exceptions altogether. Uh, and in exceptional situations, when you cannot avoid exceptions, then you throw the exception. Okay, that is my, 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 um, uh, my personal way of doing things. But I know, I know, I know some really kick-ass programmers who actually do a lot of stuff just throwing exceptions in clever ways, okay? This is a different style of programming. And so, all right, so all right, so uh, two's complement, negative numbers, um, any of these things. So if you have any questions, ask me, and I will try and explain this. And hopefully, if one of you has an iPad with with a pencil or something that you can draw on and you can share the screen, that's even better because we can work through some examples too. But you know, uh, strictly speaking, we don't need to. But we'll see. We'll come here. We'll play it by ear uh, as we're doing this. If we find uh, situations where um, we need to actually work through an example, uh, then you know, I. Uh, request if someone can share their screen and then we can do it, okay? But otherwise, most of these things I didn't do hand wavy. You know, it's something that math teachers don't like, you know, hand wavy proof, right? So I just try and explain things hand wavy as much as possible um, and, um, and and do these things, okay? So, you know, uh, take it away. If anybody has any questions, this is your time, okay? Just go ahead and ask uh, any particular aspect of the, uh, uh, you know, of the data representation issues that you want uh, clarification from me on. Uh, and obviously, if you want clarification from fellow classmates, also that is fine, right? You can say, well, thank, thank you, Anand, for uh, explaining this. Uh, I'd like to get a few more perspectives. Uh, so uh, can you give us five minutes for just the classmates to talk more about this, okay? Uh, that's great, right? So after each uh, little blurb of explanation that I give you, you can just take five or 10 minutes just to confer amongst yourself and saying, hey, you know what, can, can we work through anything? That's all fine, right? So in fact, we can take this long break that we had before and get split it up into small breaks after each of each one of the explanations that that might actually work and if it works better then maybe i'll just adopt that strategy for you know future classes too and so all right uh so uh, so that's where we are uh, so what what would you like to talk about everybody clear on some of the basic principles of data representation yeah or if you have any questions feel free to ask and i will i'll take them um it may not be in the order in which they come because you know some uh, later question might actually be required for answering this you know so we'll sequence them in the right way but just go ahead and ask any question that you think is confusing you with data representation issues and we'll talk more about that right no oh, um, everybody just... everybody really clear um yeah, go go ahead. Anything yeah. anything to do with data representation, right? Any anything in module zero data representation? You can ask. I actually have a separate question about the uh, quests. Yeah, sure. Uh, real okay. quick. Um, this yeah, is a question. Sure. From, it's a question from the Reddit forum, but um, I don't know the answer to it. Um, let's say you complete a quest, you get the code, but say you close all the tabs, you forgot your code. How do you? Is there a way to get that code back? Huh? <laughs> you just resubmit it, and you get the same code. Oh, it oh, yeah, 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 that makes sense. Okay, but that's good. <laughs> that's good enough for me. Thank you. Um, and also, uh, if, um, if you've submitted it, and uh, and if you've submitted it all, if you submitted it all with a student ID, uh, and you don't have to resubmit it, just go to the slash Q site and enter your student ID. It'll show you your history of all the quests that you've done, right? Everything, blue, green, red, uh, in this quarter, because every quarter that gets cleared, this scoreboard. Gets, so it'll show you with, with I think, the passwords. I'll change it later on this year, maybe. Uh, I'll remove the passwords uh, from that table uh, so that it'll just say, you know, um, it, what, 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 it'll just say J Tiger instead of the whole password. Uh, so that that means you can also take snapshots and, and share if necessary. Right now, you know, people are reluctant and also requested not to share that, uh, you know, scoreboard because it has passwords in it. But I can change that later on. Thank you. Thanks, Omar. Uh, any any other questions? So I do have a question. Sure, and sure. Erica, yeah. It felt kind of like I don't know if anyone like. So I thought I understood T's compliment pretty well, and like I thought I understood like floating representation okay. Um, but 
I like in the example where we had the seven and a half and we had like the mantis is like 15 and um the yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Second one is, is negative one I didn't get how the three one like the binary like the three one bits was negative one and so I was kind of oh not... oh, oh I see okay all right okay so yes yes okay so I I'll paraphrase what uh, Erica just said okay I I if my memory of that problem is this a problem or was it just something that was talked about I don't know it doesn't matter right so she's talking about um the value 7.5 seven and a half and you want to represent that in floating point notation using one byte okay one byte that's eight bits and we decide uh, to say, we, we say that, uh, and the, you know, the person who wants to represent it decided that, well, I want to use one byte, which means that I need to have space in that one byte for storing both the mantisa and the exponent, right? So how can I, how can I divide it up? And so they, they chose for, for whatever reason, right? I'm going to use three bits for the exponent and five bits for the mantisa. Yes? So, so and, and obviously the exponent can also be negative, right? Because you could have, you know, there's some value times 10 to the minus pi that, you know, right? Or the, pi, pi, for example, 3.141 times 10 to the zero, or it could also be 31.41 times 10 to the negative one. That's also pi, isn't it? So in that case, if you wanted to encode pi uh, using 31 and negative one, you got to put 31 in the mantissa part and negative one in the exponent part. Yeah. So anyway, now we're talking about bits, right? So in bits, we're going to talk about we're not using ten to the, you know, power of ten, and so, right. So we're going to use two powers of two. So we're going to say this has got to be some number uh, times two to the uh, two to the uh, some number. Okay. So and I think the way we did that was uh, to represent that we say this is fifteen times two to the negative one. Okay, 15 times two to the negative one is seven and a half because two to the negative one is nothing but a half. So now 15 can be represented in four bits. Can it be represented in four bits? Yes, <laughs> it can be represented in four bits, right? Uh, but we actually have five bits for the mantisa, but still you can represent, you know, uh, 15 can actually 15 has, uh, happens to be the biggest possible number you can get in two's complement using five bits because it is zero, one, 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 one. Zero, one, 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 one is 15 because it is two to the zero plus two to the one plus two to the two plus two to the three. That is eight plus four plus two plus one. That's 15, yes? So one, 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 one is a mantisa. You know that. So now zero, one, 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 one can go in the mantisa part. Now you got the negative one because you got, you know, zero, one, 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 one times two to the negative one. Now you got to say the three bits that I have for the exponent, I've got to represent the negative one. So that negative one has to go in there and, and you can have you, you, uh, the agreement that you have between you and the person who's gonna receive the bit pattern and decode it into 7.5 is that I'm gonna send you these two numbers and they're going to be encoded in a form that allows for both positive and negative numbers. Now you could make a decision saying that I'm just gonna uh, send you these numbers in, uh, in sign magnitude notation, which is not the case by the way, right? It's actually stored in two's complement. If, if you decided to store it in sign magnitude notation, you would basically send that person, suppose I was sending the number 7.5 to Erica. Um, so I would uh, send her uh, in, in sign magnitude, right? So the agreement, this, this contract between the two of us has to be in place already because otherwise I could send her a packet and she wouldn't know how to interpret it, yes? So before I send her the eight bits, we need to have an arrangement in place saying, well, when Erica receives eight bits from me, this is how she's gonna <clears throat> divide it up in five and three, five bits and three bits. And the, the five bits are stored in sign magnitude notation and the three bits are also stored in sign magnitude. If that was the case, <clears throat> then the bit pattern I would send Erica is zero, one, 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 one. That is the 15. And then the remaining three bits are going to be one zero one yes or no because in sign magnitude notation one zero one is negative one in three bits because the leftmost bit is a sign bit and that being a one says it's a negative one and then the remaining is the is the is the uh, magnitude zero one is one so if if i was to send it in sign magnitude notation to erica i would send zero one 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 zero one now that is not what two's complement would do, right? So if, if on the other hand, Erica and I had a different arrangement, okay? And I said, uh, well, you know what, Erica, I'm gonna send you this, these bit patterns, but the, the mantisa and the exponents are gonna be coded in two's complement, not in sign, sign magnitude notation. 
right? Then the numbers will be coded differently. So negative one coded in two's complement notation is one, one, one. Now, why is that? Okay, that is really the, the root of the question that Erica asked. So Erica asked, why is one, one, one negative one in two's complement notation? In fact, it's not just it, three bits, one, one, one is negative one. If you use four bits, one, 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 one is negative one. If you use seven bits or eight bits, one, 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 right? So all ones, that is negative one. So why is it? Why is it that, you know, all ones is negative one in two's complement notation? No, it's not obvious, right? It is not obvious. And in fact, it would actually help. It would help uh, if, how, uh, let's look at the time. Uh, how long will it take if we did this? Uh, it'll take about 10 minutes, okay? Right, it'll take, if we work through this in class, okay? We work through, I'd like someone to take the screen, share their screen with me, especially if they have an iPad. But does anyone have an iPad or a tablet they can share with the, uh, uh, great, Omar. Okay, great, okay? So uh, share the screen. And then we'll work through an example. Uh, and in fact, I think it should take 10 minutes, okay? 8.50, so we should be done by nine o'clock. Uh, this this explanation, right? Uh, if I'm not done by nine o'clock, someone should raise their hand and say, hey, Prof, can you speed up, okay? So, <laughs> because I don't want to digress too much uh, on this. So uh, what we're going to try and do, I'll try and explain what two's complement is from basic first principles, okay? In a way that even kids can understand, right? Well, your kids do, but you know, even smaller kids can understand. Uh, so I'll explain it in a way. Uh, and hopefully that will um, set the foundation for uh, for the reasoning behind why numbers are like that in two's complement, okay? And we'll start with decimal and, and, and decimal, decimal, right? Not decimals, right? Decimal, and, and we'll do it that way. So when Omar uh, shares his screen, so what we'll do is, um, yeah, all right, I'll use the same example I've used for you know previous quarters because I think I haven't found a better example. Uh, and if you guys come up with a better example, you know, tell me and we can side track into that. So here's the example I'm gonna use. Uh, suppose we have this uh, country, right? Suppose we have this country where social security numbers can be negative, right? So here in the US, uh, all social security numbers are positive. Yes, every uh, every number is, you don't, uh, what is your SSN? I say my SSN is minus 47, right? <laughs> so you don't have people with negative social security numbers. But so let's say uh, the, the government suddenly decides, well, you know what, today, from today onwards, we're gonna make uh, it easier for people to get together in social circles by easily identifying negative people and staying away from them, right? So all negative people will have negative social IDs. <laughs> you know, only positive people will have positive social uh, social security numbers. So suppose there's this country where, uh, you know, uh, people have negative social security numbers. When it comes time to filling in the tax returns, let's assume that they can put the dash symbol. You know, we, we, how do you write negative five? Is a dash five. Now let's say that, you know, they're gonna be writing numbers into boxes, their social security numbers into boxes, you know, 10 boxes, put your numbers in there, right? Uh, however, they can put a dash in there because their system that recognizes these boxes and uh, understands these numbers is not set up to understand a dash. It can only understand numbers, zero through nine, okay? So the challenge in this country is how do you represent a negative number without using the negative sign. That's exactly the same challenge we have in computer science, yes? Because we don't have, the bit, the bit is a transistor which can exist in a, in a bistable state. It's called a bistable oscillator. You know, and those of you who are doing uh, electronics and computer, you know, computer engineering might recognize this, an oscillator. A pendulum is an oscillator, right? It oscillates from this side to that side. But a pendulum is what is called an astable oscillator. It doesn't have a stable state at all. If you take it to this state, this is not stable. You let go, it's gonna go to that state. Right, but that side is not stable either because it's going to come back here, and it's going. To, and if you didn't have friction and loss of energy, it's going to keep oscillating forever, like the Earth around the Sun. Yes, so it's called an astable oscillator. No stable states at all. However, uh, you can take a magnet, right, and even assume a steel bob, okay, and you put the magnet on one side, not the other side, okay. Now, if you take the the, the bob and take it to one side and stick it to the magnet, magnet, now that side is stable, isn't it? Because if if the bob goes to this side, it's stuck and it's stable. It's not going to be oscillating. Right? However, if you let go of it, it's gonna go, it's gonna go all the way to the other side. There's no magnet on that side. So it's gonna come back and stick to the magnet again. Yes or no? Okay, so that kind of a pendulum is called a monostable pendulum, right? It's not astable anymore. It's got monostable because it's one stable state. Yeah, now you can have magnets on both sides. That means that, you know, regardless of which side the pendulum is in, there's a magnet to stick to. So it's called a bistable pendulum, right? It's a bistable pendulum. So still it's oscillating because it oscillates from here to there, but it can stick on both sides. Now, it, it is possible to replicate exactly that behavior in physics to the electronic level, right? And using transistors. 
And that is what a transistor is. A transistor, you can using transistors, you can build, you can easily build it, right? You can build a, you know, buy a breadboard and you can build an Arduino, right? It, it's called, a, it's a bistable transistor. And a bistable transistor will basically stay in one state and all it needs is an electrical pulse, right? A, a jolt of energy, right? And you send a pulse of energy, it'll just knock it off the stable state and send it towards the other state and it'll go and stick there. Right? Another jolt of energy can send it here. So now you have a controlled way using electrical pulses. You can control whether the pendulum is going to be on this side or that side. We're not a physical pendulum anymore. It's just a virtual electronic pendulum, but it's inside. But now you have a way. You have a way in which you can send a brief electrical pulse, nanoseconds, right? Now you can't even, right? You send a pulse and it can flip it from one side to the other. Now all of a sudden you've got a bit because you got, you got a configuration, an electrical circuit which can either be in a one state or a zero state. Yes? That is your bit, okay? Everything inside of a CPU is based on that. Now, that is one bit, right? Which can be put together using transistors. Now, inside of this phone, inside of this phone, there are, uh, today, because of advances in technology, there are 128 billion billion of those little pendulums. Right. And so, so, and, and each one, and even more, even, even, even more mind boggling is that even though there are a hundred, is it 128 billion, billion, I think so. Right. So gigabytes, right. So it's individual, even though even more mind boggling is that even though there are so many different switches out there, we have the ability to control an individual switch anywhere and there. Right. We say, I want to change the state of the, the, the pendulum at uh, position 4,717 from one to zero, right? And imagine how difficult it would be if you had to go like that, but we have the technology because we can you know, route these things efficiently these days, but you can change all of those instant. That is why all these massive parallel kind of computations are possible because they're all happening at such uh, you know, rapid uh, changes, right? Okay, all right, so great. So what we'll do is, yeah, thank you, Omar. Thank you for doing that. So here's what we'll do. So let's say uh, we have, uh, a number, uh, let's take uh, 435, right? Just pull a number out of thin air, right? If you, if, you, if you have a different number, just write a different number, doesn't matter, right? Uh, th three digit number, um, three digit number, okay. Now we wanna, we're not talking about bits and bytes, okay? Imagine this is an explanation that you should try. You should try this explanation on your kid brothers and sisters, okay? And, and see if they understand it. If they understand it, it's great, isn't it? Okay, so, so the challenge here is that uh, there's, let's say there's a, Ten four digits, right? Let's say there are a thousand people. Yeah, let's say there are a thousand people in this country. Okay, there's a thousand people in this country, uh, and some of them are negative. Let's say 500, 500 of those people are negative people, and five hundred of those are positive people. So you want to have negative social IDs for five hundred people, and positive social IDs for five hundred people, and zero for one person. Okay, so um, yeah, okay, great. All right. So now we want when it comes time to fill. Uh, uh, or the tax returns, um, there will be a box. So can you draw a box and with four compartments in there? Four compartments. Um, great, great. Okay, now the challenge is to put the, let's say that uh, that person, 435, is actually a negative person, okay? So they can't write 435 in their social security box. They have to write negative 435, but they can't write negative 435. They have to write a number in there. So the challenge there is to figure out a scheme by which you can use four boxes and come up with a negative number. Uh, a way of representing negative numbers without using the negative sign. Okay, and this is ingenious. Okay, and, and maybe you want to watch this video again because it's really ingenious. The way that this was done is ingenious, and and it is it is ingenious for many reasons. One of them is the reason it is ingenious is because it is, I think, in my opinion, it is the best possible example of a situation. The simplest possible example. Okay, not the best, right? The, one of the simplest. <laughs> let's say one of the simplest possible examples of a way in which intelligent humans have taken a shortcoming a drawback, okay, a disadvantage, so a limitation, right? We've taken a limitation and turned it into an advantage. How cool is that, okay? Because the limitation here is that we only have four boxes. We can, so if you have a bigger number, you can't put it, you know, there's only four boxes. You can't put, you know, you can, anything more and it'll spill over. Yes, so that's our limitation. Now, how can we use that limitation to our advantage? Okay, this is how we're gonna do it. Okay, so we wanna represent 435. Now we go rewind all the way back into what numbers are and, and, and you know, and, and think about what negative numbers are. 
a negative number, if you think about it, is all that the, the biggest function of the negative number that is useful for us in all these manipulations is that if you take a negative number and add it to its positive counterpart, okay, any negative number, x, right, add it to its, but negative x and add it to the positive x, what do you get? Yeah, thank you, Omar, right? Uh, so uh, <clears throat> zero, so if you take a negative number, add it to a positive number, you get to zero. Now that, so we say, we don't care what you write in the box, as long as if you add it to positive 435, you get all zeros, because that's all we're going for, right? And we say that anything you can put in the box that will give you all zeros when added to 435 is negative 435. Now, is that a reasonable assumption to make? We're gonna go step by step, okay? Because these are questions you'll ask your kid brother or sister, right? So is that a reasonable assumption to make that in order for me to represent a negative number, I'm gonna come up with a positive number, which is <laughs> a positive number, imagining it's possible, okay? Now, technically it's not possible. I'm gonna come up with a positive number, which if you add to another positive number, is gonna give you all zeros. Okay, in real life, in real mathematics, it's not possible, right? You cannot add two positive numbers and get, negative, get zero. However, with this limitation, it becomes possible. All of a sudden, this limitation makes it possible for us to add two positive numbers and get zero. How is that? How is that? Can someone tell me that? Because I, I don't expect you to know the answer because it's, it's a kind of clever uh, solution that probably only hits you when you're biking or showering or things like that, okay? So you may not get it like that when, you, when, when someone asks you, but it's actually very clever. How can you add two, there is a limitation, but you only have four boxes to put your write your number, okay? You have to somehow leverage that limitation and come up with a way in which you can add two positive numbers and get all zeros. You get zero by adding two positive numbers, you know? And you ask a mathematician that, they'll say, you're out of your mind, you're mad. That's never possible, okay? In fact, they can come up with a zillion different proofs that it's not possible to do that, okay? However, injecting that computational limitation, it becomes possible all of a sudden. How is that? So can, can someone, would, would someone like to take a stab at it or would you like me to tell you? Right. Two more seconds. Nobody says I'm going to take a stab at it. I will tell you. I think I remember it from our reading a little bit. All right. Go, go ahead, Omar. Go ahead. Yeah. I uh, remember. Um, I think I have to write this down just so I can explain it better by drawing. But um, you take a binary like 1101. Mm -hmm. And I heard something about like now add like kind of like the inverse of that for every one put a zero for every zero put a one. Mm hmm. And then in the end, you will end up with all ones, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm going to take that same thing because, oh, sorry, let me rewind a little bit. So if you have a number that's all ones and then you add just a one, mm -hmm. then you end up with all zeros and then the one in the end. But if that like overflows the limit of like, I guess, four in this case, then it does get out and now you're left with all zeros. So in the end... I'm going to repeat on the right, 1101 and the 0010. And as a shortcut, you could just erase that zero on the right and add a one. Excuse me. And it's the same as the left, just a little shorter. And you're left with all zeros with that extra one that overflows. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Omar. That I think you pro he probably explained it much better than I can. Uh, I, I would have. Um, but you know, I'll do it in a different way because it's a, we'll do it in decimal. We'll do exactly what Omar did in decimal so that it's easier. Um, but that is exactly it. Now, did uh, did people understand what he was trying to say? Or well, I can try to, to say the same thing in a slightly different way. Okay. So what Omar did was leverage the fact that since you only have four boxes, if you do arithmetic operations and you end up with a number that is bigger than what will fit in the four boxes, whatever is you know carried over from the, you know, the most significant number that's going to overflow. It's overflowing, right? So, and, and it'll be discarded because there's no place to put it. That's exactly the strategy we're going to leverage here, okay? So here for negative 435, we're going to say this in, in this country, they say, well, you know what? We want to find negative 435. So let's start with 435 first. So write 435. Um, you don't have to put it in the boxes. You can just write 435 somewhere, um, right? And under 435, we want to come, come up with... Um, Oh, actually, I read 0, 4, 3, 5. No, no, just 435 is fine. 435 is fine, okay? So, um, 
Yeah, yeah, all right. So what we want to do is come up with a number that when you add to 435 is going to give you 1,000, okay? 1,000. Well, we have four boxes. Can you, can, hey, uh, Omar, uh, can you just change that to three boxes? <laughs> three boxes and um, yeah, three boxes and then change, you know, rub off the, the we'll make that three boxes and, right? Yeah, thank you, right? So we have three boxes, 435. Uh, <clears throat> and so we want to come up with a number that when you add to 435, gives you 1,000. Now, when you write 1,000, what happens is that you can only fit the three zeros in a box and the one does not have a home. And so it'll be tossed, yes? And then you end up with zero. So you have two positive numbers, you add them up and you get all zeros because the extra one got tossed. It couldn't be stored, okay? So, so how do we do that? So we take 435, and come up with something and it's, how, it's what we do is basically the easy way to do it i'll show you the easy way to do it is basically um write another number right under 435 such that you add the two together and you get all nines okay get all that's easier usually rather, rather than subtracting it from 1000 because subtracting from 1000 is, is a pain subtraction and division are all always pain isn't it right the multiplication addition we always love to do but no not subtraction and division okay so we want to get 999 you want to add 435 to X and get all 99. We want to get 99. That's the first step. Okay. So now that's easy to do, right? Five plus four is nine. So four should go under five, right? Six plus three is nine. So six goes under uh, three, right? And four and five, right? Now you got 564 under 435. Now, if you add those two up, you get 999 at the bottom. Now, but that's not what we want. That's not zero. You need to add one more to get 1000, right? So add one more to that and you get 1000. Yes? And in the 1,000, uh, you only have the zero, 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 and the one will be discarded. The carry is discarded, and so you get zeros. Now, uh, so instead of adding the one to a 999 now, let's just take the one and add it to the 564 itself. So now we got 565. Now we know that 435 plus 535 will give you all zeros with the one that is a carry for a thousand that cannot be stored and will be discarded. Now that country could say that since we only have three boxes uh, and we have you know a thousand people with half of them negative, uh, we'll use Tens complement. This is called tens complement. Okay, not twos complement. It's tens complement because we're taking away from ten. What's left as a complement, right? Just like in geometry, right? So you have the angle, and the complement of the angle is what is left if you take ninety away from it. Right? Take it away from ninety, I think, or one eighty, or something like that, right? So the complement is what is left over. So five sixty-five is actually negative four thirty-five. So that country could say, if you store numbers, uh, my social security numbers, in um, in tens complement notation. Then, you know, the first 500 numbers, uh, zero through to 499, they are non-negative numbers, okay? But after that, everything is a negative number, yeah? And so now, now from, if, you, if you look at it from this way, you'll, you'll see immediately that 999 is actually a negative one. Yes? 999 is negative one. Because if you add one to 999, you get 1,000. So 999 plus one is a zero. That means 999 was negative one, yes or no? So using that strategy, now everything should fall into place with binary because in binary, we're not dealing with you know, base 10 anymore. It's just base two, it's a zero and one. Therefore one, one, one is actually negative one because if you add one to it, it becomes one, zero, zero, zero. And you, there's no place to store the one, it'll go away and it'll become all zeros. So one, one, one is negative one. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Okay, that was like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is, uh, and, and again, uh, thank you for asking that question, Erica, because uh, it actually uh, is going to help you when you're doing the data representation quiz. And uh, even when you're thinking about data representation, it, binary in, in general, is that anytime the, a problem, uh, an arithmetic problem, I don't want to say mathematical problem, right? Um, an arithmetic problem in binary seems confusing, whether it's converting from one base to another or converting from, you know, whatever it is. Um, Many students will say, well, you know what, it's binary, I have to learn binary. And just, oh, the simplest thing is, is you already know how to do all of these things in decimal. <laughs> We've been doing this since we we're in kindergarten. So, so the thing is that mental block saying binary, that's a gatekeeper. And a lot of people just get turned away, right? So forget about the gatekeeper, right? The lenient gatekeeper. So say, I don't care about binary. I just want to know the technique. The technique is the same, whether it's binary or decimal. So I'll just try and understand the technique in decimal first, because we know how to do it in decimal. And then say, well, now that I know how to do it in decimal, I'm going to do the same thing in binary. Then it's all pretty straightforward and simple. Now, does that make sense?
Okay. That is basically two's complement. Okay, so we talked about tens complement. This is two's complement. Two's complement is doing exactly the same thing in binary using zeros and ones instead of zero through nine. Now, if if people have, still have you know uh, questions about it, I'm happy to answer them. Or if you want like five or ten minutes to talk amongst yourself, right? Uh, Omar already has a screen here, so he can help out by you know if if, if someone says you know let's try this out, Omar can uh, say well let's try it out, and he you can you can uh, you can help out by being the scribe. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. So yeah, I'm so so he's offering to help out. So if you want five or ten minutes to just talk about two's complement and work through some examples on your own, so one of one of you calls out an example, another another one tries it out, and Omar is going to type it out. Uh, and uh, so it work. Do you want ten minutes to talk about this before we go on to the next question that someone else may have? Or if you know, if uh, otherwise, if someone has a question already, go ahead and ask. That's fine too. If you want five minutes to just do something on your own, um, and and enable this concept down first, uh, let me know. Right, five minutes is not a big deal. Uh, we're, wow, it's 9.10. Well, I, I meant to take only 10 minutes to talk about this, but it, it took 20 minutes. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> hopefully it's a calibration point for me, right? So next time I won't say 10 minutes, I'll say 20 minutes, next quarter, right? So um, so do you guys want five, five or 10 minutes to talk about this on your own? You know, noodle this and brainstorm more, uh, and then we'll come back and talk about the next question, next issue we may have. We're already talking about, you know, two's complement and floating point here. Uh, so that's almost the end of module zero, really. Yeah, uh, so so I think we have a lot of time this class. And by the way, uh, I, I will uh, offer extra credit. You know, uh, uh, certainly I'll consider for extra credit for uh, people who undertake the challenge. At the end of module zero, there is this challenge saying, convert your name into, uh, into I don't know. Yeah, you consider your name to be a number in base 27, right? Where, you know, space is zero uh, and then A is one, B is two, and so on. In, in, in binary, we have zero and one. In decimal, we have zero, one, two, three, up to nine. We say in base 27, you have 27 numbers, zero, A, B, C, D, E, F, all the way up to 26, you know, Z, right? So consider your name uh, as a number in base 26 or base 27 and convert that from base 27 into hexadecimal, right? We say all of the, you know, the procedures laid out. Um, and when you convert into hexadecimal, if you're really, really lucky, Right, you may find that you have a pronounceable name in hexadecimal because in hexadecimal you have you know uh, O can be interpreted as a, as an a zero can be an O and uh, I don't know so people say oh you actually have an E you have an E you have E F A B C D E F right uh, so maybe when you turn your name into hexadecimal it actually turns out to be a pronounceable name right uh, if you get a pronounceable name I'll give you uh, let's say one ex one extra extra credit point okay so I let's say one extra credit point for everyone who can convert their name into hexadecimal but if your hexadecimal name is pronounceable <laughs> right you get an extra extra credit point okay and now so far in all of the quarters that we've done this since i wrote module zero uh, only two people have had names that convert into hexadecimal and that were pronounceable uh, and in fact three quarters ago i had a student uh, i think their name was sam and uh, uh oh i don't know was it was it their name or uh, i don't know they, they did something abe abe i think Abe, or something came up with Abe. Uh, yeah, yeah, whatever they converted can turned out to be Abe in hexadecimal, A-B-E, right? Uh, it was really cool because they said, you know, my name is uh, this, you can uh, pronounce it, but in hexadecimal, I'm actually Abe, <laughs> the president of America or the past president of America or something, like that, right? So it turned out to be Abe. Um, and, so, and it's actually on Reddit too. You can go and search for past posts. It's getting harder and harder to search for past posts, but it's there. You can look for posts by Sam uh, and, uh, and, and they found this, name uh, was uh, pronounceable in hex. So yeah, so you should do that. You should absolutely try. And that would be the crowning um, aspect of module zero. Once you can do that, you're totally comfortable with data representation issues, right? So say, well, you know, this is a number uh, and this is my name in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, you know, in English, you would uh, pronounce this uh, Adelzer or Erica, uh, but, you know, after converting to uh, hexadecimal, my uh, name is actually, you know, uh, something else that is pronounceable. You know, I can't come up with something like that off the top of my head. Also, you can consider lead speak, lead speak possible. So you can treat the three as an E also, three as an E in lead speak. Uh, and, you know, I, I know you got to look it up on Wikipedia. Lead speak has these uh, conversions. Three is an E and then four is an A because they look like A and it's like that. Uh, so you can use that and say, well, it's not strictly pronounceable, but if it's pronounceable in lead speak, right? Uh, so that is also possible, okay? Even then you get points. So try, try, it's fun, it's fun, right? It's fun um, and you should uh, certainly try this. Definitely over the weekend, you'll have time.
to try this out. Okay. So how about five minutes of your time to just noodle these issues and um, choose complement, floating point, uh, anything else that you guys want to talk about. Uh, working through an example is great. Okay. You know, together, working through an example together. Um, that'll be fun. You want to do that for 10 minutes? I'm going to be here. Okay. I'm going to be here, but I won't be in your face again. Right. I'll be behind the laptop. I'll be out there. Maybe I'll make a cup of coffee or something, um, but I won't be watching you guys. Okay. So you want you want five or 10 minutes? Yeah, and I'll actually set a timer for 10 minutes. So I'll come back after 10 minutes uh, and then we'll resume with more questions. Is that okay? Do you guys want 10 minutes or you want to just keep going ahead with the next topic or next next question? Up to you, right? Because as I said, all of my classes, free form. I'm not running any of my classes. You guys are running all of my classes, okay? Which means that we're going to go according to your pace, what you guys want to do. Is there anything you want I can talk about? I can talk about CS2C stuff too if you want, but you know, it's not going to help you for your exam in 2A. Um, um, and obviously, if this is really interesting, we can set up a separate time to talk about it, right? Uh, and those things. Uh, and I am making these, you know, for people in 2B and 2C, uh, I'm making separate times outside of like, regular meeting hours uh, for extra credit projects that we're working on, right? So we'll be working on some extra credit projects, some interesting stuff, you know, some game or um, things like that. We'll be doing that in 2B and 2C. Um, but here, um, uh, you know, we don't have to do that, but I'm uh, happy to do that, right? If you have, if you, if a bunch of you want to, uh, extra explanation on something, right? More practice, more practice, uh, coding something up later on, right? In in the coming weeks, if you want to say, well, more more practice uh, coding this uh, with the professor, uh, you, know, you know, pulling us out of places where we get stuck and so on. I'm happy to do that, right? We'll pick a time outside of lecture uh, hours, and we and we can uh, walk through these things. Yeah. So, yes, raise your hand if you want five or ten minutes to just you know play around with some with some examples on your own. Right, I'm raising my hand. <laughs> right, but uh, all right, Omar, uh, Erica, Namrata. All right, uh, Justice, Ahana, <clears throat> uh, Ruzi, uh, you have nobody. You, you guys don't want to uh, raise your hand if you want five minutes to just work on something, uh, you know, and and follow along an example of your own. Okay, so this is if the majority of the class students want to do this, and we'll do this. Uh, Yu Yang, uh, Justin, Lu, Antonio is raising his hand. Um, all right, Mohammed. Sabrina, yes. Yeah, it looks like most of you are on board uh, with this. Okay. Uh, now, my, you know, your camera is not on, so I can't see you. Um, you've at least got to speak up and say yes or no and things like that. Okay. Because otherwise, I don't know if you're, you know, logged in and took off to Starbucks or somewhere. Okay. So you need to be here and uh, and present in class. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this in your hands now. Okay. For ten minutes, I'll set a timer. I'll come back in ten minutes. Okay. All right, so good luck. Have, have a lot of fun working with these numbers, okay? And, and like I said, only today, next week onwards, we'll start coding and we'll be working with C++ code, not numbers like this. So this is your best chance to do these things. Thanks. All right, okay. Thank and you call me. If, wait, yeah, I do. Call me, I, call me. Wait, I do have one question. Um, You mentioned like earlier, yeah, yeah. we could do the, the name challenge Um, and like post that on Reddit, for, like for some points. Could we like yeah. do that for like some of the other challenges? Like there's one that was like take a friend or like a classmate or something and do the same thing. Oh, you can do that totally, totally. You can say yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, why don't we? That's even better. Okay, even better. Uh, rather than convert your own names, right? Get together with friends and pair up and say I'll convert your name, you convert mine. Okay, do, and then you can convert your classmates. Both, right? We could do both, right? <laughs> You can do both. You, you know, hey, <laughs> knock yourself out, okay? Knock yourself out. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, as long as you're playing with numbers, that's fine. All right? So that's great. Yeah, thank thank you. Okay? All right. So call me if you if you guys stuck. Um, otherwise, I'll be back in 10 minutes, okay? Alexa, start a timer for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Starting now. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to clear this whiteboard, but I'm going to leave it on for another maybe 20 seconds if you want to screenshot it, take a picture. I like, I always screenshot that. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, so, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. You're really pulling through here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> do we want to try an example with base 27? Like just grab a random name or we can do mm -hmm. name here. We can totally do that. Let me uh, clear this whiteboard in five seconds while I look for things too, because I started trying it with my name. I don't know how far I got. I got through my name, um, I think. But I also could be completely wrong with what I'm doing. So, mm -hmm. sure. The right. only thing that I remember getting through is there's this one, uh, like practice problem that I found on online, and I it's like a small sentence, and I was able to get through that, but it's not, 
it's definitely not the most intuitive uh, base, I guess. It's definitely, yeah, it's definitely not super intuitive in my opinion. Yeah, mm. it's, pretty, it's kind of tedious. <laughs> well, from, from what I could gather just from module zero, it just, I mean, it's just a number coordinated to each letter of the alphabet. You know, Z is the last letter, so it's number 26. But I don't know how you would read it because is that a two or a six or a 26? Like, how do we determine are there spaces in between the numbers? I just don't know how to write it out, I guess. Would it um, Z be 27 if we start with space? Wait. Space is Scratch zero. That. Scratch that. I realize yeah. what I was saying. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I feel a little dumb because I was confused about the zero. I was like, quotations means zero. No, 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 it's space. Okay. So space that is zero, A is one, right? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can start a new whiteboard this time on Zoom instead of my iPad. I think it gives us more space. I think like a, yeah, throwing like a random name and like doing it together might be, I guess, good. Good. I'm going to take... Like a... Excuse me. There we go. Here. How about I take a name like Alex? And I'm trying to zoom in here so I can write better. Hmm. Let's add a last name too, like Alex uh, Smith. <laughs> I was thinking Smith too. There we go. Okay, what I'm going to start doing is listing, just so we can all keep up, and I need this too. I need this really bad. Let's see. Um, I do have a little chart here that's just number for letter of the alphabet, because I don't want to do the alphabet song in my head every single time and count. I know, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I'm, well, I'm going to do it here, so we can all see. F G H. So we know space is zero. And A is one, two, three, four, and so on. By the way, is this readable? Is this readable? It's not too small. It's not too. Yeah, you're yeah. good. You're good. You're good. Okay, good. I can't tell from my iPad. So looking clear. Fantastic. Thank you. And then zero space. Okay. okay. So if we take Alex, we have A, which is one. Oh. One. I think we're adding, right? L is 12. E is 5. X is a bigger number to 24. And for Smith, 19 plus M is 13 plus I is 9. Uh, plus T is 20 and plus H. <laughs> I just put an H instead of a number. Okay, eight. So. Yeah, not quite. I think those are like the numbers that it correlates to are the exponents that you would take, like, or the, yeah. So oh, like, exponents not the... Wouldn't the exponent just like be increasing? Because in the example in the reading, I think those numbers are the coefficient, right? That you multiply with the 27 to the exponent. Oh, so B will be 27 times two, for example? For example, in the reading, the professor does his own first name. So like in the same case, like A is like one. So like if we're starting with the left, I it would be like now. one times 27 to the zero. Or 27 to the four, not starting up. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. That's right. I forgot about that. Okay. So 
Um, and I have to look at the reading. It helped me a lot there. Da, 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 not that one, this one. Yeah, I remember it was a good example with the A's. I'm a little confused. How does that change things? I'm, I'm about to show here. So I know that A ends up. Goodness. So basically, a, each this, number that we got is going to be times 27 to a certain power. And whatever position it is, it starts at zero. And then, so for example, A would be times 27 to the power of zero. Then L would be times 27 to the power of one, so on and so forth for however many letters. Is I think I we got. need to go right to left, though, because in the example where the professor uses his name, he starts with four times 27 to the zero. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is the, with, starting with the D. So it actually starts with the rightmost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what the zero so will be. Yes, yeah, so it'd be 24 times 27 to the zero power. So the first digit should be 27. The last. I'm sorry. Yeah, 24 times one. 24 times one. In this case, so we start with the last name then? Right, sorry, I'm looking at the example two. I think I think you could do those as separate. Yeah. Uh, two separate ones. Let me erase this for a sec. Excuse me. Okay, so I'm a little lost again. I did this yesterday and I forgot. Um yeah, I remember he put it on backwards too. A and A and D. You're supposed to post this in Reddit? Uh, for the extra credit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any specific flares or? I think you could just start your own. Um, I, I don't think it was specific about that, but yeah. OK, thanks. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, right. OK, depending how many uh, letters you have, you do go backwards. Alex has four digits. You, which gives, which we end up with 27, oh, 27, one, 27 to the two, and 27 to the three. That's four. Um, we go backwards, but in this case, I'm going to go in order. So A would end up being, would be with this. L twenty seven to the two E twenty seven to the one X to the this, and then we take that number and multiply it. So A was uh, one. So take this number and multiply it by one. L was twelve. Take this number and multiply it by twelve. E is five, take this number, multiply by five, and X is 24. I think I'm good so far, yes? Yes. Yeah. And I'm gonna calculate like that, that is a big number, so I'm gonna use a calculator. 27 to the third. We end up with, and let me do this. One nine six eight three plus L would be twenty seven to the two times twelve. I end up with eight seven four eight and then twenty seven to the one is twenty seven times five equals one three five. And interrupt me anytime if I'm like off somewhere. This is 24. And I think we add those together, we end up with a big number. Also, you're all welcome to play with the whiteboard. It's a huge whiteboard. You could just, just do anything. You, there we go. We end up with 
two, eight, five, nine, zero. So that would be uh, the answer in 27, what do you call it, base 27. Mm -hmm. I think that's the name Alex in base 27. Yeah. Yeah, that looks right. Awesome, thank you. Having seven letters in my name <laughs> makes this a really large number. <laughs> All right, so let's take the next 20 minutes to do your name. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that was just doing Alex, and then we, we could do Smith. But also part of the extra credit, we want to see if we could turn this into, for example, hexadecimal. Thank you. Um, how would we do that? <clears throat> What's the first step? Do I go back to the original Alex or can I do it from this big number here? Wouldn't it be dividing that number by 16? Uh, you start from that number, not the original Alex. The green yeah. number? Yeah. The green, yeah, the 28,000 mm -hmm. divided by 16, right? And we keep going until it goes to zero. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, gotcha, okay. So let me try that. So if I take, this is for, Hexadecimal. Okay. We start with 28590. Then we're going to divide that by 16, right? And I'm going to do what I do here calculating. It's apparently if, let me do that again, I did that wrong. Divided by 16. Here we go. I end up with one seven eight six point something something something, but I'm gonna round it down and then take a number again, seventeen eighty six. Here, so you can see my work. Let me write that down. I so think that also right there, you need to take the remainder, which with the point eight seven five is uh, fourteen. Yeah, remainder fourteen. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna clarify that too. That it's. 1786 point something 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 and then the way I, cal I calculate the remainder but please let me know how you do it is taking that number again once it's rounded down multiply by 16 86 times 16 you could probably do it by i too but and you end up with 28576 you take the original number 28590 subtract and then you end up with the remainder which did we say was 14 yeah yep in yes you are correct thank you so that's where i put remainder 14 to the side here and then i just keep continuing that so divide by 16 again and we keep going also does i wonder if anybody has like a faster way of doing that that's how i do find the remainder I'll take the dec or the decimal and then multiply it by in this case 16. Oh, I'm up here. Let me go back so I can show that word. That sounds more effective. Oh, Two, really eight, <laughs> zero, divided by 16. So let's say instead you end up with you do write down the decimal 1786.875. Take that. 0.875 multiply by 16 and you should get the remainder which is 14 yep exactly right that sounds more simple yeah times 16 you, um just to make the note there on the on the whiteboard thank you <clears throat> that was oh right six i'll put six 16 okay thank you oh that's much more simple that, that makes way more sense to me okay yep. so i'm gonna keep going with that <laughs> Mm hmm Thank you. Okay, divided by 16. And there were one, one, one. And the remainder 0.625. I'm gonna multiply that by 16 and I get 10. That is much faster. Remainder 10. And I keep going. And then one divided, excuse me. Here we go. 
Point up with six. And then I put a decimal aside, 0.9375, multiply that extra decimal by 16. 15. Remainder 15. And then lastly, I can just do by I then remainder six with the zero, 16, all that. Okay. So hexadecimal would be, and let me start with the numbers first. Going backwards, you have six, 15, 10, 14, but we know then hexadecimal, I think starting with 10, we start with um, like the alphabet, which we end up with six is six. 15 is F, I think. You have, that's right. Yeah. 10 is A. 14, why am I lost? E, I think. I think that's it. Oh, and then you'll write it down as um, zero, X, and then the total sequence, six, F, A. I think that's right, yes? yes. Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> six, Fe. All right, that is pronounced. I just had a quick note. So in this case, we're doing just the first name, right? But if we were doing like the whole name, then we start with the the H of the Smith and then work backwards. So there'd be like a much bigger number, right? I think um, when you work with both names, um, you do it as one unit and then the space would be the zero. Um, okay. So yeah, in this Alex Smith case, we would have had one, two, three, four, five. We would have had... Um, 11 characters to do. Oh, so yeah, I'm gonna do the whole name together with a space. Then yeah, you're right. That would be 10 digits in total. Yeah, okay. 10 characters, excuse me. Okay, thanks. Good to know, good to realize. Okay. So this, this whole example was just Alex, just the name Alex. So you can imagine how much more work it would be with a longer <laughs> name or not more. That's really cool. <clears throat> Almost pronounceable. You know, I thought when you got uh, when you got the F A E, I thought that was really cool. This is someone's got <laughs> someone's got a name uh, that's pronounceable, <laughs> Faye. Um, but um, really cool. Hey, by the way, uh, Omar, on your calculator, is there a percent sign? One of the keys with a percent sign? There is. Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. So you can use that to get the remainder. Like if you oh, did, uh, yeah. I think if you did eight eight percent three, I think it should tell you two because eight remainder eight divided by three leaves a remainder of two the percent is actually the modulus operator oh does it do that wait mm, maybe i'm not doing it right you said um yeah eight divided by three should leave a remainder of two i put eight divided mm -hmm. by three not divided by three eight percent three eight percent three oh oh eight percent three no eight percent Oh no, on a calculator, percent means something else. So it, it must probably. say mod. Um, do you do is just say mod? Do you have a key called mod or something? Maybe mod or no. rem rem or uh, re rem remainder. Rem remainder. I'm not no? seeing that on my uh, iPhone calculator. All right, don't don't worry. Yeah, um, but so good to some, know. <laughs> some calculators, yeah, some calculators have that um, that modulus key. It'll just do the division and give you the remainder. Uh, but you know what? Uh, Adrian suggested it was a good idea too. I think it's it's the next easiest thing to do. I think is just to take the uh, the fractional part and multiply that with the uh, sixteen. Uh huh. I agree. Great. Yeah. Well, you know, once when they said you know Alex Smith, uh, yeah, they, I thought wow, they're setting themselves up for a huge challenge here <laughs> because you're going to be going 20, 27 to the power nine and and you know fiddling with these huge numbers. Uh, it's uh, funny. So there's one time uh, when I was in class, when, when I was teaching this face-to-face -face in class, um, I think there was a student. What was her name? Amelia May. Amelia May. Uh, and then I forget her last name. Uh, but Amelia May was hyphenated, right? So <laughs> Amelia hyphen May or something like that. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, and she said, how do I convert my name? Because there's no um, you know number for the dash. Uh, so I said, oh, that's really simple. Uh, you got to convert. Amelia first, and then uh, then convert May, 
And then you look at your name, it says Amelia minus May. So you got to do <laughs> Amelia minus May in base 27. That's your, that's your name. A subtraction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's possible, isn't it? Technically, anything you can do in base 10, you can also do in any base. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but that's funny. Uh, hey, this is good, 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 good. Uh, fantastic. All right. So um, I think what you can, you guys can do is uh, set yourselves up with, uh, you know, so maybe just pairs or rings where you know each person converts the name of the person right 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 to the right of them or left of, left of them it doesn't have to be a physical ring in the stem center where you're actually sitting here you could actually construct a virtual ring right just by email saying well you know what uh, can you be the next person and then and find the next person next person next person and then some person could say i couldn't find the next person i'm going to link back to the first person okay so you got a ring and now you can say well i'm going to convert the person in front of me yeah so you can try that too and um and that will be fun. Just you know, group exercises, coming up with ways uh, of uh, working together, coming up with interesting things that you can do together is basically setting the stage uh, for greater things that you'll be doing later on uh, together. Who knows, maybe it's the same, maybe there's a good dynamics in this group. And later on in five years, some of you get together and say, hey, let's start a company or let's build a product together, right? So, and, and this, these are the ways in which you can start off the collaboration by simple things and, and saying, because it's always better. I find in my experience that when, when you have a brand new team, uh, they, their dynamics are much better when they are together from the beginning. Um, well, you know, if you can put people together um, on higher level projects, but they have to be experienced people. Right, experienced people who already know how to work uh, these things, um, but uh, this actually works wonders. Uh, in in junior teams, uh, starting them off with simple things, they just figure out because nobody nobody can work a hundred percent with somebody else because everybody has certain ways of doing things, preferential ways, um, and nobody wants to step over the other other people's toes either. Um, but and have, uh, unfortunately, nobody wants to ask other people to what what bugs you, what you know, uh, because if you know, if you ask them what bugs you, I'll, I'll not do it. That kind of solves the problem, but nobody wants to do that. So, but working on these little projects, you actually get a feel. Uh, and, and, and then slowly, uh, as you work on the bigger projects, you'll automatically subconsciously steer off, steer clear of things that might irk your uh, fellow teammates and, and thereby build a kick-ass product together. So this is great. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that you guys were able to do this. Uh, go ahead and, and, and try as many as you want. Uh, we have time. We have about eight minutes left before class officially closes. And after that too, uh, I'll just, you know, leave the recording on and, and I'll be here. Uh, we won't stop it until the last person goes. So it'll all be uh, recorded. But for the next 10 minutes, when most of you are going to be here, um, ask ask anything else that you'd like to uh, work on right now, right? I, I'm with me uh, also, right? So I can, I can help with something else. Are there any other concepts uh, with data representation? that you guys um, would like. I had a question, but that wasn't related at all to data representation. Oh, um, go, go ahead. So um, on Tuesday, I wasn't able to be here because the, the, my power went out in Campbell, so. Yeah, yeah, uh, you, you sent email, you sent email. Yeah, yeah, is there like a recording that I can reference or like, is there anything big that I missed? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, all, all, of, all of our classes are recorded. Um, they're okay. on our YouTube channel, right? So if you go to our YouTube channel, if I, just make sure to pick the uh, recording, look at the date, okay? Because we have all the, prior quarters also just okay the data. Um, okay so. and w w will i find the youtube channel on the modules or in the syllabus or um... actually i uh i forgot if i put it in the modules um or in the syllabus mm -hmm. um it's it's called non-linear media okay the same as the question the quest non-linear media so that middle word non-linear media is the name of the channel okay so you just okay. go to YouTube and look for the channel okay perfect thank you any, any, anything else, any other questions you guys have um, that I could answer? Anything else you guys want to work on uh, together? I, I'll be here, right? I'll be here. Uh, anything else you want to work on, I can uh, help out. That's great. I didn't realize Alex was almost pronounceable here. <laughs> six, actually, B -fay. B yeah, because six, I think, is in lead speak six is, uh, lead, lead speak six is B, right? So it may be B -fay, but still it's not. Oh, it's not B -fay. Mm -hmm. B -fay. <laughs> Strangely enough, uh, there is a uh, there is a bit pattern. There is a bit pattern. Um, you know, actually, uh, you can Google this, right? The, the word dead beef, dead beef. Okay, it's hexadecimal. <laughs> you know, dead beef is actually a hexadecimal number too. 
And uh, so uh, yeah, there, I'm, there's probably a history behind this word. Um, mm -hmm. If you Google, I'm, maybe you'll find it on Wikipedia. In the ancient days, in the ancient days, when computers were, you know, huge beasts, you know, occupying entire buildings, um, and, and um, memory used to be stored, I think, in cores. That's why it's called core dump and all, right? Called magnetic cores, meaning one bit needs that much space to be stored, right? So it's all stored in there. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, the engineers, maybe at and Labs, or maybe Berkeley, I don't know, right? Um, they wanted to find out a way in which after program has been running, uh, what parts of the memory are untouched, right? These parts have been allocated, these parts have been untouched. So what, what parts of memory have been untouched? Can, can we look at it and find out simply, right? Without having to, uh, and they said, well, you know what, let's fill it up, fill up all the, un uh, fill up all the memory with a bit pattern that we can recognize easily. So any, and then we can look at the dump of the whole memory and anything that doesn't fall into that pattern that we can see and recognize has not been touched by, by all the programs we've been written. And, and the pro and the, and the pattern they decided ended up, uh, you know, uh, ended up on, uh, it was, it was dead beef. And if you convert dead beef to binary, you'll find some big number, right? Uh, and they took that and filled up the entire memory with one, 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 all, all of those, you know, one, zero, one, zero, whatever dead beef converts into binary too. And, and so that when they look at the screen dump, they'll see a lot of dead beef, right? And, and then here they'll see the actual data of the computer, which, you know, and, and so, so it's got some history to it. Um, so that is converting from hexadecimal to binary. But uh, hexadecimal is good to know and important to know because when you get to, to later uh, stages of computer programming, uh, when you want to look at memory contents, like what I said now, right? Dead beef. Uh, the programmers who want to know, well, my program is not working and, uh, and, and something weird is going on, uh, but I can't see anything wrong in the logic. So something out there in what is being written and co copied back, something is getting corrupted, right? So I wrote 57, but uh, someone else changed, some other program erroneously changed the 57 to 59, right? And then when I read it back, I didn't get 57, I got 59. And as a result of that, my program crashed. Okay, so uh, people want to, so when you're debugging your programs at an advanced level, you'll start looking at various different memory, memory locations and saying, well, you know what, in order to make sure my program is 100% bulletproof, I need to monitor these memory locations and make sure they don't change unpredictably, okay? Uh, so, so you'll set up in your debugger, you'll set up breakpoints and watch points and saying, okay, while my program is running, I'm going to watch, <laughs> watch these memory locations. And, and so you'll be looking at these memory locations uh, later on. Uh, and when you look at the contents of memory locations randomly like that, um, the, the CPU or the, the computer can show you the location in bits, right? You say, oh, that memory location contains 11000, right? But as you know, it's so hard for us to understand even big number, decimal numbers. You can understand, you, you, you can imagine how difficult it will be to read a big binary number, right? Uh, and that is why uh, these numbers, when the CPU, the, the computer spits out numbers at us, it'll try and print out these numbers in hexadecimal format, which is really condensed binary, isn't it? Because you take four bits of binary, it goes into one single hexadecimal character, yeah? So if you have a, a two bytes for a uh, number, that's just two hexadecimal characters. That's why when you do debug dumps or look at programs uh, and so on, you'll just see a lot of hexadecimal characters, right? They're just bits, they're just bits and bytes that get translated internally into uh, CPU instructions and data. Does that all make sense? <coughs> was was this class useful? Um, did you guys uh, get something useful out of this class? Yeah, uh, and and data representation is now is you know more comfortable, definitely. Yeah, more comfortable. Hey, Mohammed, you have a question? No, you, you're raising your hand. Yeah, okay. Uh, <coughs> everybody, okay? Number that. Um, I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, in the reading uh, and like the scientific notation uh, section. When it says it's converting 7.5 to binary, it says 111.1. I was wondering why that there's like a point there and how that works in like actually converting it into binary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, 15 um, in floating point notation is, I think it was 1111.111.111. Isn't, 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 that, isn't that what we uh, did, uh, Erica? Yeah, so 1111.11, one, 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 one. is uh, yeah, number that, is that what you got in the, whatever the reading was? 1111.111, one, 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 one. that's seven and a half, isn't it? Because 1111 one, 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 one is 15, yes or no? In binary, 1111 one, one, one is 15. Yes. Yes, and what is 111 in binary two's complement? Just three ones, 111 one, one, one in binary two's complement. Negative one. Hmm? 
Negative one? Yes, yes, negative one. Therefore, that bit pattern, one, 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 is basically 15 times two to the negative one. So 15 times a half is seven and a half. Okay, I see. Does okay. that make sense? Yes. Great, great, great. Any, any other questions? Um, uh, let me go through really quickly and ask each of you so you can either raise your hand and say good, or you can say, you know, <clears throat> I need to, I need to think more about this. That's fine also. All right. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, Eric is good. Mohammed is good. Uh, Hannah, that's me. That's good. All right. Uh, Hannah, you good? You good? Yeah. Okay. Jay's good. Uh, Omar is good. Uh, Ruzi? Ruzi, good. Okay. Uh, you how? All right. Mingua. Adrian? Good. Yeah. All right. Sabrina? Yeah. Good. All right, you young, uh, is it your hand up or are you just, is, all right, okay, good. All right, uh, Elijah? Yeah, all right, Simon, Karthik? All right, great, I'm very pleased to see this, right? Uh, I hope you're just not all raising your hand, but I think I can see from, you know, from what happened today and, you know, and your faces that you all actually do understand the stuff, right? Not sleeping and saying, well, I'll pick it up later. That's that's great. Uh, you young, uh, Antonio, you, you guys good too? Justin, you good? yeah justice brown michael your camera was not on nam i don't even know if you're here okay uh so uh you, you won't even get participation points if you just come in, uh, attend class and not um you know participate at all all right uh omar omar oh omar you got two screens oh that's your one of them is your ipad and the other one is your okay <laughs> cool all right that's all i think the other people might have left it's probably past 10 o'clock no it's just a 9 51 just all right so i got to give you enough time to get to your next class um I think uh, I think the campus is open today. Um, is it? Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Fantastic. You know, as I I I, uh, I tried to do this, uh, but it didn't work out this quarter um, because our class is at eight a.m. Uh, but I tried to ask uh, the STEM Center guys, you know, Constantine, if they could come in at eight o'clock, <laughs> come in at eight o'clock on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and basically open up the STEM Center when nobody else will be there. Only, only you guys, right? Because you know the STEM Center officially opens at ten o'clock or something. So only you guys, and and we have this really cool room with you know climate con 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 controlled and uh, free coffee and <laughs> cookies and everything out there. It's very nice with all the uh, pretty much top of the line IMAX <clears throat> out there. So everybody could be sitting at these IMAX, and we could have these classes on. In the STEM center, everybody's sitting, you know, in in, uh, in the STEM center in front of a an iMac. Um, but obviously, it's eight a.m., so it didn't work out. We'll see. You know, maybe uh, maybe in a future quarter, if that works out, that'll be cool. That's a good good experiment for me to try. But I'm very happy with this, right? Even though uh, you're all at home, uh, this is fantastic participation, right? I have not had this level of participation, interest, and enthusiasm, even in classes that I taught face to face. Right. Even in classes that I taught face to face, people were, you know, in the back row, they would watch YouTube. Uh, and then I have to walk to the back to see what the hell they're doing. And they don't. They, and here everybody's engaged. Everybody's helping each other out. It's fantastic. I'm so happy. Right. Uh, and I have a very good feeling about this class. OK, so thank, thank you all very much. That's all I have to say today. Uh, and I hope to see you all on Tuesday. OK, so I, I usually say this at the end of uh, week one because, you know, I, this is a drop in line or something. You know, <laughs> this is lots of people will say, all right, 2A is not for me. But I do hope to see every one of you in 2A, not only just uh, completing 2A. I want to see every one of you go all the way to 2C, right? Once you've mastered 2C, finished 2C, I am confident, OK? I'm confident that you're actually ready to be employed out there by you know, a top software company, because it actually teaches you all the really, really core skills that everybody values out there, right? And uh, and the, the other stuff is something that you would be able to, if you've mastered to see, you'd be able to learn all the other stuff on your own too, very easily, I think. So I'm, I I would like to see all of you get there. And, and I'll be with you every step of the way, okay? I'll see you through. Thanks. All right, so see you next week. Have a good weekend. Uh, keep keep coding, right? Do, do, do the coding, even though you're formally coding only next week. Um, but, you know, even if we try and code now and it doesn't work out, it'll all be good practice. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.